It's not Christmas, but it's as close as we're going to get to Christmas with a with church service. So, because we're not meeting on the actual twenty fifth, and uh, you know, as I've been reflecting on all that the season means, the most basic point of the season comes to the forefront, and that is, you know, the living Word came not only to be with us, but to be one of us. God became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Easily, two of my favorite passages in the whole Bible regarding this are in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, which you can turn there, turn there if you wish, and also John 1, 14. They are an announcement of the fulfillment of one promise, which has the greatest significance in both Testaments. Um, it, it's the fulfillment of the very first promise that God ever made to humanity, as well as the most often stated promise, and that is that a Messiah would come. Hebrews 10, 5, and this is one of my most favorite ones, and I was telling Terry just yesterday, I was surprised, I'm really surprised how often this is not brought up as a Christmas verse. To me, it's like, I love this verse because it is, probably because of the way that it's worded, it, it, it shocks my thinking and brings me right to the manger. It brings me right to the birth of Christ and the intention of it. And that's uh, Hebrews 10, 5 says, So when he, talking about Jesus, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Yeah, see? It hits you, doesn't it? But a body you have prepared for me. And we don't, we know immediately because we know the story and we know the the significance of his death, burial, and resurrection. We know the significance of the body, right? Uh, Peter goes out of his way to point how important the body was because uh, you know back in our Word of Faith days we always thought well the only thing that really redeemed us from sin and from the eternal consequences of sin was that Jesus had to die spiritually he had to go to hell and he had to be brought out of death because if he didn't do all those things then we will which of because it's all extra biblical. The Bible doesn't even hint at any of those things. What the Bible does say in Peter is that he, in his own body on the tree, dealt with sin. Sin was dealt with once for all before he even physically was put in a grave. In his own body while he was still on the tree. Yes or no? Yes. While he was still hanging there, right? This was all with the body which is why the body was so terribly important, which is why the body goes, the Bible goes out of its way to stress the importance that Jesus was a literal, physical human being. That which we have seen with our eyes and our hands have handled. We touched him, right? Of the word of life, right? It was important that it was a physical body because without it, there can be no physical death. And without physical death and shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The Bible doesn't say that remission of sin is given because someone goes to hell for you or someone becomes separated from God from you uh, as far as eternally and spiritually dying. It doesn't say that. It says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. That's what the Bible says, right? And so the body becomes terribly, 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 terribly important. And then, so there, and the wording, therefore, th this verse says it all. Because it connects his body with the sacrifice, doesn't it? So when, the, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. So eternity steps into time. Jesus as the actual creator, because if you go through the scriptures, and we're going to read it this morning in First John, my, my favorite account by far of the purpose of the good news, the purpose of Jesus is found in the Gospel of John, the first chapter. And so we spent some time there this morning. The fact that, that Jesus became incarnate, that he was wrapped up in flesh. The Bible says that in, in, in 1 John that he is the one who created all things. Je out of the Godhead, the Father, who we call the Son and the Spirit, out of the three of them, the one who is the architect of this universe is Jesus. He's the one that, the Father didn't make the universe. The Spirit didn't make the universe. Jesus made the universe. Hello? And as the creator, can you wrap your head around the paradox? He became one of his own creations. 
a feat that only God could pull off, right? But in this particular case, Jesus divested himself of, of uh, or, or re relinquished the right to participate in the use of his power and his glory. And so he had to rely upon the Father. The Father prepared for him a body, right? How did the story go? The Bible says that uh, that God sent, the Father sent a, uh, an angel to tell, you know, Mary and Joseph and all that. But then it says, when it came to do with her conception, the Spirit of God hovered over Mary. It's the same very, it's very similar to the word that's used over in Genesis where it talks about how the Holy Spirit at the very beginning says, hovered over the face of the waters like an incubator, okay? And, and that inside of her was conceived a baby boy, physically, the body, the spirit came from God. In fact, the spirit was God, that inhabited that little body. Amen. Now, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full replete, overflowing with grace and truth. Jesus' incarnation is the single most, God bless you, is the single most significant event in all of human history. It was the turning point. Without this reality, the prophecies of old would have remained unfulfilled, and the redemption that we now have and enjoy would never have happened. Now, have you ever had um, you know, a meal placed before you that was decadent in the extreme? You probably have because Ron cooks for you, um, <laughs> right? Uh, decadent in the extreme, so much so that after you, uh, the, the 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 rich flavors of the first bite hit your tongue, you were sure that you wouldn't even be able to finish the meal. The flavors were just too intense. I'm not entirely certain that uh, this isn't uh, too much of a good thing. You know, I, I've had very few meals like that, but I've had a few where just the first bite, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to get through the, and it's usually not even a big plate. But it's just so rich and so overpowering that you're like, you know what? I'm not sure that I can get through a whole meal of this. It's that good. Well, you know, that's exactly how I felt at the beginning of our study day. That's how it hit me. Today, we're going to look at the incarnation of the Word of God and what it means. As you know, the person of the Godhead, who we affectionately and with great respect call Jesus, was not always known by that name. So far as the scriptures have chosen to give us a lens into his past, his existence before the creation, from eternity past, he was called the Word. In fact, that's how John begins his gospel account, his good news accounts of Jesus, earlier in this first chapter of his gospel. In John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's also how Jesus portray, is portrayed in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. It says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. So as far as we know, that was always Jesus' name, if he was given a name. Now, so let's look at John. That's what we're going to kind of capitalize on today is John's account of this, what John saw, and what was the basis of his good news account. You know, I, I love John's account because of these things, mostly because we're privy to his intentions. Not all the Gospels do that. And this is another reason why I like John. John is very personable. He got relationship. He understood intimacy. Uh, you know, out of all of the disciples, you see an intimate connection with Jesus that's different and deeper than the others. He's the only one that even showed up to the crucifixion. Right? He's the only one that even showed up. At, at, the, at, the, at, at the feast, at, the, at the, the, the Last Supper, he's so close that he leans, leans his head on Jesus' chest. Try as I might... I cannot see myself laying my head on another man's chest. I just can't see it. I'm just... No, that's okay. <laughs> a handshake circle or a hug with a pat, pat, pat. That, that'll suffice. But none of this laying my head on some guy's chest. But, you know, there was none of this 
um, Jesus is a male, I'm a male, therefore I can't get that close to him. He, his, his love, his adoration, his respect, and more than any of those things, his capacity to receive and acknowledge Jesus' love for him made all of that stuff just go away. And what was just came natural to John just happened. And so there at the at the feast, he lays his head on his chest. Right? This is the guy that we're talking about. And in that gospel, in his gospel, he gives more understanding of the of who Jesus is. You see Jesus in his deity more than you do in his humanity in the in the gospel of John. You see, and the thing I also love about John is, like I said, he gives you his intentions of writing the, the, the account. He tells you, this is why I wrote this, this gospel account. This is why I took pen to paper. The others don't tell you that. So you understand his intention. And, and that makes sense if you read the gospel because his gospel is filled with what the intentions of Jesus were in his actions rather than just his actions. If you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see what Jesus did. When you look at John, you see why he did what he did. Why did John have that kind of vision? Love. Love. Those who love, God says that he will hold no good things back from those who love him. So he had eyes to see that the others didn't have. So, you know, mostly we're, we're privy to his intentions of running this gospel account. And because his capacity to believe the love God had for him was clearly exceptional. John's gospel account tells us in John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31, it says, Now Jesus performed many other miracles, miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are recorded so that you may know and believe that Jesus is in fact Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. <laughs> Thank you, God. Thank you for the gift that was John. Amen. <laughs> Thank you that, you know what? I mean, John's, uh, John knew precisely what he meant by those words, too. John's reason for his gospel was to point to Jesus' purpose in redemption, which was life. You know, he, he, he had heard Jesus say as much um, in, uh, um, regarding the message that the Father had sent him on earth to preach. It's found in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 24 through 27, it says, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, but it's John's account of it, and John's the only gospel that mentions it. It says, I tell you the solemn truth, the one who hears my message and believes the one who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned, but has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the solemn truth, the time is coming and now is already here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Just, for just as the Father has life inside of himself, thus he has granted that the Son have life inside of himself. Now stop there for a second because Jesus was God and had enjoyed eternal union with God from eternity past. But now that he was a human, that relationship had to be granted to him. He, had no, he didn't have any leg up above any other human being on this planet, other than the fact that he was born without sin. But he had the same limitations you and I do. If the Father had not granted him intimate knowledge of him, he wouldn't have had it. You remember in the in the Old Testament it talks about how the um that before the child knew right and wrong it says he was given he was given curds and honey to eat that he might choose learn 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 to choose the good and reject the evil. Jesus didn't come in here as a baby knowing all of this. He had to learn it just like any other human being. He didn't come into the world as a baby while nursing, and in his mind he's thinking, well, here I am finally. You know, I've only got 33 years before this is over. He wasn't thinking anything. He was a baby. He didn't think in terms of language. He didn't know a language. He was a baby. Now, I don't know if the, the miracle and the wonder of what was done for us often really dawns on our cranium. What really happened here? You know? I mean, what kind of vulnerability are we talking about? That God himself would become a child, a baby, and entrust himself to his physical well-being 
to humans, who, by the way, don't have the greatest track record, or he wouldn't be here. Right? The most perfect human beings that had ever walked on the earth screwed it up probably less than a week in. Right? 5,000 years later, people haven't gotten better, and he's going to allow two of them to be his parents. If they don't feed him, he doesn't eat. If they don't change him, he lies in his mess. If they don't teach him, he doesn't learn to talk or walk. Vulnerability. Trust. Man. <laughs> the, every time I say it, I still, it buckles my mind and I still realize how much I don't really get this. We don't understand trust, not really. We can understand trust by putting in trust in something that's greater than us, that we know will not fail us, and even then we, we have problems with it. And yet God chooses to trust man who he knows is not only capable of falling, but in fact will. And yet he chooses, I'll become vulnerable to you and trust you. That's love. That's love on a level that our minds don't yet understand. We, I can say it and your minds can process it and you can think about it, but do you fully really understand that kind of trust, that kind of love? No, you do not. Neither do I. I can articulate it. I can, I can conceptualize it, but I don't understand what it is to have that kind of magnanimous heart. I measure out trust based on how I feel safe. Jesus had no basis for feeling safe. And yet he trusts. You know, this is this is part of by the way, this is believe it, I'm not I'm not I am getting off of what I have in my notes, but I'm not getting off of what the point is, because this is what you're invited. That, by the way, is eternal life. Eternal life is knowing and trusting. It's based upon who you are more than it is based upon who they are. Trust is who God is. It's what he does. Right? Yes, go ahead. Just a quick thought, and maybe if it's off track, I can ask you later. But he didn't receive the Spirit until after he was baptized by John. The Spirit upon him. Yeah. Yes. Spirit now, he had the Spirit within him before yeah, that. Him. Yeah. And and we, we know that Jesus had the Spirit of God with him because that's what it is to be a human being that's not fallen. You're born into this life in union with God. Okay, Adam and Eve were in union with God before they chose to rebel, but they did not have the Spirit of God upon them, and neither did Jesus until the day before of his ministry. That's right. So going on in, in John chapter 5, it says, uh, it says, I tell you the solemn truth, the time is coming, and now is here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, thus he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has also granted the Son authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And in, in John 12, verse 49 and 50, all of these references are found in whose gospel? John's. He says, For I have not spoken from my own authority, but the Father himself who sent me has commanded me what I should say and what I should speak. You know, you need to understand that from eternity past, there was no such relationship between the father and the son where one would command the other to do anything before jesus came there was no hierarchy the father did not sit supreme as grand poobah and everybody underneath him just did his bidding it didn't work that way there was eternal equality this only became even possible when jesus became a human At that point, it is not only possible, it's appropriate that the Father command him. Right? Again, are you getting a picture of what Jesus gave up? Says, he says, But the Father himself who sent me has commanded me what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command, I know, I know, I know it. See, Jesus had intimacy with the Father. You and I sometimes say, well, I think what God was trying to tell me is, Jesus said, I know what he said. I know his command with absolute certainty. It's really, the, 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 the nuance of the Greek word here is, I know with absolute certainty 
what he commanded me to teach. I know it better than I know my name. I know it with no more surety than I know that the sun will rise tomorrow. I know this. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Thus the things that I say, I say just as the Father has told me to say. You know, in fact, you realize that you and I would not even really have a full grasp of what eternal life is if it weren't for John? It's in his gospel that it, the clearest definition in the entire Bible is given is in his gospel. And, 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 and perhaps it was because John was one of the few people who had ever existed who had eyes to see it because his capacity to receive the love that God had for him. But I'm telling you what, that, that, that can't be overstated. In fact, it's John. <laughs> John, in the in in First John, who said, "We have known and have chosen to believe the love that God has for us." Well, John, that was a true statement of John, and it's a true statement of all who have come to know God through salvation. But to what degree? Well, that's another topic. But you know, you, you your capacity for experiencing and knowing the love that God has for you is certainly no less than John's was. John didn't come into life with a leg up above you any more than Jesus did. We all have the same capacity. Something about John saw something in Jesus that lowered his defenses enough to allow himself to be loved. Allow himself to be seen through the eyes of another person that for some reason that he may not have even been able to articulate, he trusted implicitly. And if this man loves me, there must be something to love. Right? Something that we often question with ourselves. You know, John tells us in chapter 17 of his gospel, he recounts the prayer Jesus breathed out to the Father before entering the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm going to read it from the Woos translation because I think it, 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 it capitalizes on certain things that are very, very important. It was a normal thing, evidently, for Jesus to just be walking with the disciples and then just turn and start talking to the Father. Because out of all of them, Jesus was very aware that the Father was always present. He was just as much part of the group as the twelve. And so he lifted up his, uh, his voice, uh, uh, eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son in order that your Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, in order that all that you have given him as a permanent gift, he should give to them life eternal. And this is the eternal life, namely, that they might be having an experiential knowledge of you. The words be having doesn't exactly flow off the tongue, but it puts it exactly like the Greek had it. In other words, that eternal life is not something that you just got when you got born again and you keep in your back pocket until you die. It's something that you have in the now. It's in the continuous present. I have eternal life right now in my union with God. In other words, a child of God can live outside of eternal life by not walking in union and intimacy with the Father because that's what eternal life is. Are you hearing me? You can be his child and deny yourself your birthright based on your choices. Hello? Your birthright is intimacy with God, union with him and enjoying him forever. But you can deny your birthright if you wish. It's a foolish decision that we all make it somewhere in many times a day. But we don't have to. He says, namely, that they might be having an experiential knowledge of you, the only genuine and true God, and of him whom you sent on a mission, Jesus Christ. This also shocks my thinking, just like the Hebrews passage does, because Jesus refers to himself in the third person. There's a, there's a couple, one or two translations says, and this Jesus Christ whom you sent. Jesus was the one speaking. That'd be like me saying, and this Mark Watson who you sent. Well, that doesn't really flow off my tongue. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense because I am Mark Watson, right? <laughs> but Jesus realized that he had an existence before he became a human being. And that this human life 
who is known as Jesus, which means Savior, you sent. You prepared him a body. And eternal life is to know this Jesus that you placed in a body. This Jesus. Right? You know, it is with all of this knowledge of Jesus, just some of the things that I just mentioned this morning, that he stated his mission on earth, that John begins his account of the good news with the words, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Who made them? Jesus. And without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. He's creator. So far as I can recall, the first time I ever thought to even look up the word with in these verses um, was yesterday. And I was immediately glad that I had done so. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And I thought, you know what? It would be just like God for that to mean what I think it means. But it's not translated that way, so I'm wondering. So I looked it up. In the Greek, there is a preposition. It's P-R-O-S, pros, which when used in this way implies not just proximity to God the Father, but rather an intimate personal relationship with Him. As such, the word with would be better translated as was in fellowship with. So it would read this way. In the beginning with the word was the word, and the word was in fellowship with with God. From eternity to past, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that's the names we have for them, lived in fellowship with one another. Perfect union. And that perfect union was wrapped up and incarcerated in a body. Union with God was the message. And it was placed in a physical body. Oh yeah, that I don't know about you, but to me that just starts off pretty rich. So far as I know, Woost is the only translation that capitalizes on this word meaning. He translates it like this. In the beginning, the word was existing. And the word was in fellowship with God the Father. And the word was, as to his very essence, absolute deity. This word was in the beginning in fellowship with God the Father. That's a lot more rich than the regular King James and New King James would have you believe. Before the beginning, there was fellowship. There was what I've told you, the word before you guys know, perichoresis. The, the word perichoresis essentially means the, the interpenetration of the three persons of the Godhead. It's not interrelation, it's interpenetration, where they literally flow in and through one another. It is a deep knowing. A knowing that surpasses anything that we have come to realize. Each being of the Godhead is an individual, but having no separate existence from the other. They dwell with in and through each other. In them is perfect union. There's no rivalry, no attempt to be the other person, but a complete acceptance and awestruck admiration for their individual perfections, which work and flow in perfect concert with one another. They are a collective of admiration, yielding, preferring, and honor. They are love. This is the life the Bible talks about, life eternal. Once more, it is the life that we, as beings made in their likeness and image, have been invited into. I, 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 it would do you a really good service to spend some time trying to imagine, and I know we're going to fail because we're humans. It's hard for us to imagine something outside of our experience. But try to imagine what eternity was like before there was ever this creation. In fact, roll it back further. Before there was ever a heaven or angels or anything, it was just the Trinity. That was all that existed, period, 
anywhere. And imagine the union that they enjoyed. The interpenetration of their relationship, their deep admiration. The father is not the son. The son is not the spirit. They're individuals. They each have different ways about them. Now, none of them have got selfishness. None of them have got um, a lack of trust. None of them have got selfish ambition. So that is what makes them the same. But they've got differences about them. We've capitalized on that many times. I, I, I tend to capitalize it on Mother's Day when we use the Holy Spirit as a type of, of, of female. Because she, as you read through the Bible and you learn the attributes of the Holy Spirit, it's very feminine. And, and, and the Father and the Son seem very protective of the Holy Spirit. They don't seem so protective of each other. They honor one another deeply. Deeply revere and respect one another, but they're not so protective of one another. They're very protective of the Holy Spirit. You can speak against my Father, and you can blaspheme me, but you say a word against the Holy Spirit, and it will never be forgiven you. Well, that would indicate there's a difference between the three people, wouldn't you say? Of course there is. So you got three very unique individuals who have lived in perfect deferment and love and mutual admiration. The father doesn't tr doesn't see attributes in the son and says, man, I wish I was like that. I'm going to try to be just like him. No, he just allows the son to be the son and he admires him for all of his perfections. He admires him. He adores him. He defers to him. He worships him. The, worship, the word worship means to kiss the hand. It just means to adore. Do you think the father doesn't adore the son? Of course he does. Well, that's what the word worship essentially means. The father, the son, the spirit, they all worship one another. They adore one another. They defer to one another. They prefer one another. They admire one another. And out of this divine interconnection, they create human beings and invite them into that expression of existence forever. We are inviting you guys into the perichoresis. You realize that's not been given to angels. That's not been given to cherubs or seraphim or anybody else. The only, so far as we know, creation God ever made that have been invited into that union is us. Of all the goofy things God ever made, us, we are the ones invited into this. Eternal union, knowing and being known on a level that we have never even at this point understood. That was the message. Listen to me, guys. That what I know, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. If you've been born again for a long period of time, it's hard to get out of the gridlocked idea that the entire message uh, to the shepherds that day and to Mary and, and to Joseph and to the, the Magi who traveled so far and to the world through the Gospels is that Jesus is saving you from your sin. You think that is the message. No, it really is not. It never really was the message. Now, was that is that part of the message? Absolutely, because it was necessary to be redeemed for our, from our sins in order to get what the point to what the point really was, and that was enjoying God forever in union. You can't flow together in an interconnection and interpenetration between us and the Godhead if we are radically different than they are. If our very essence is offensive to their nature, right? So something had to change. But rather than scrapping the whole thing, like we were saying this morning, you could have left us on our own. But you're here. It chose rather to redeem than to just throw away. To start over. Right? Amen? And so that was the point. Remember, what did it say in the, in the book of Galatians? It says, if, if there had been a law that could have given this union eternally with God, then, then, then righteousness, right standing with God, divorcing you from sin, redeeming you from sin, would have come through the law because life was the goal. Life was always the goal. Righteousness wasn't the goal. Righteousness is a means to the end. The end game is life. 
It's always, and, and again, you hear me say this, but and don't answer me because I don't want to know. But how many of you bother to actually go to your concordance and look up the word life and see how often it's on the, the words of Jesus' mouth as he's speaking the gospel, as he's preaching? He doesn't usually, he comparatively, he brings up redemption from sin almost not at all. He brings up eternal life all the time. So how did we make it about sin? Because we are so self-focused and we're so aware of our own failings. We are so not like John who wrote this gospel, who just freely accepted the love that God had for him. Because, And the reason why we don't is because we're more conscious of our failures than we are on his love. And that was the good news. You don't have to be conscious of your sin anymore. You don't have to be conscious of you at all. I'm inviting you to be conscious of something greater. That was the message. Was it necessary that you be redeemed from your sins? Absolutely. I'm not saying it wasn't part of the message. I said it's not the end game of the message. It was a means to the end. You realize I'm not going to be standing around the throne of God worshiping for eternity saying, thank you that I'm no longer a, a, um, you know, a miserable sinner. The word sin is not even going to be, you realize sin, the word, the concept is going to be removed from our dialect and our way of thinking. We're not going to remember the former times. All we're going to know and enjoy is eternal union with them. Well, if that's what eternity is, well, that tells me that that was what he was aiming at. Are you following me? Do, so, I mean, again, I'm not asking, I'm not wanting you to tell me if you've done it, but do it. Don't take my, please, don't. I mean, you are doing yourself a huge disservice by taking my word for anything. Look it up. You will be surprised how often life and eternal life are brought up in connection with the message Jesus was preaching and that Paul was preaching and that John and, and Peter and James was teaching. Can you imagine an action that the Trinity would find any more offensing, offensive than edifying self above themselves. Self-focus, self-perfection, I mean, pr protection, self-awareness, selfish ambition are as contrary and foreign to God as anything ever could be. Those thoughts are not even part of the Godhead. They don't think like that. And we've been invited into a union with them. The good news, the message to the shepherds that night was, don't be afraid. Listen to me carefully, for I proclaim to you good news. Good news. That's what the word gospel means. Gospel means good news. The good news of Jesus through Matthew. What Matthew came to understand the good news was. Mark. Luke, John, right? The good news. They were written, but their, their, their whole gospel, the, that, that account that we read, that we have right there in the, the, the very beginning of our New Testament is an explaining of what the angel was talking about. Are, are you getting this? Is that making sense to you? The four gospels are a revealing of what the angel said. He said, carefully listen to me because I'm proclaiming to you good news that brings great joy to all people. Today, your Savior is born in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a vast heavenly army appeared with that angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is well pleased. The word gospel means good news. And we know the good news was Jesus, but in Jesus, what was God saying? Well, let's see what John says the good news was. Again, John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was in fellowship with God, and the Word was fully God, and the Word was in fellowship with God from the very beginning. The words in the beginning or from the beginning don't mean since the beginning. It means since before the beginning. It predates that. Okay, In Him, 
in Jesus was life. And the life was the light of mankind. Who can tell me, what, what does the word light here mean? Does it mean that when Jesus walked away, he was like this big flashlight and everywhere he went, it just illuminated the natural world around him? What does the word light there mean? Revelation. That's right. Revelation. In Jesus was life, and that life was the revelation to man. Intimacy with God as a human is possible. I'm living proof. Jesus was the message. In him was intimacy with God. And the intimacy that Jesus had with God as a human being was the revelation. It was the message. It was the good news. Notice it didn't say... Even though you guys are lousy sinners, God likes you anyway, and he's chosen to redeem you, and that's the message. No, it says in him, because he could have said in him was redemption, and redemption was the light of man, was the revelation to man. He didn't say that. He said life was the revelation. You see how easy easy it is just to read past this without reading it? You know what I mean? But John was saying something by this. You do know that John knew the definition of life. Remember, in 16 chapters, he's the one that tells us what life is. It's to know you in intimacy, in the now, in my every moment. To live in an intimate experience of the Father and the Son. That's life. And in Jesus was that. And that was the message to mankind. That is what the angel was proclaiming to those shepherds. Good news. You can not only be reconciled with God, but you can live in perfect union with him forever. To know and be known experientially and intimately with God. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And that light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness has not mastered it or even comprehended it. And we already know that. Haven't we read that in 1 Corinthians the last several weeks? The world in its, in its foolishness can't see Christ. It can't see the Spirit. It has no knowledge of Him because when they hear the message, it's not that they're unfamiliar with the message, it's just when they hear it, it's foolishness to them. Right? It has to be spiritually discerned, estimated, and appreciated. Right? The light shines on in the darkness, but the darkness doesn't master it and comprehend it. Jesus said in his high priestly prayer, I'm getting away now from John, the first chapter, but I'm still in the book of John. Jesus said in his high priestly prayer to the Father, he said, but now I am coming to you, Father, and I am saying these words while I am here in the world so that that they may experience my joy completed in themselves. Listen to the kind of benevolence that's in the heart of God for you. God says, you know what? I experience joy on a level you guys don't understand, and you never will. No. He says, you know what? I'm coming to you, and I'm saying these things while I'm still here, in the flesh, in the world, so that they might experience the same joy I have. God's not holding out on you. He wants you to have the very best. Well, what's the very best? Eternal union with God and the joy that comes from that union. Wow. He said, experience my joy completed in themselves. Completed means brought to maturity in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you should keep them safe from the evil one while they're in the world. They do not belong to the world, just as I don't belong to the world. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, so I am sending them into the world. And I have set myself apart on their behalf for them, so that they too may be truly set apart. 
I am not praying only on their behalf, but also on the behalf of all of those who will ever believe on me based on their testimony. He prayed for you that day, Pam. He prayed for you that day, Donna. You too. All of us, right? I'm praying for everyone who will ever believe on me based on their testimony. That's all of us. Jesus, while he was still on the earth, prayed for me. This is metaphorical. It's real. The living incarnate God prayed for Mark while he was still here. What was his prayer? He's not praying that you should uh, only on the, on their behalf, but also on behalf of all those who will ever believe on me through their testimony, that they all will be one just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. I pray that they will be in us. The interpenetration of the perichoresis. Just like I am in you, Father, and you are in me, that they may be in us. That there will be no more separation. Man and creator forever united. Life. That was the message. Hello? In Jesus was this union. And this union was living proof that it's possible and it was the revelation to man. It had been one thing if Jesus had just come down here in his own glory and not clothed in flesh and say, see, I can have fellowship with God. I don't know what your problem is. But he became just like one of us and was able in the situation of being a creation, able to have eternal, perfect union with the Father. That was the message. It's possible. And furthermore, I'm inviting you into it. Right? I don't know if this is getting into your cranium like I pray to the Lord that it is. He says, the glory that you gave me, I have given to them. He's not holding anything back, guys. That they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one. So that the world may know that you sent me and you have loved them just as you have loved me. Just as, just as. Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am forever so that they can see my glory that you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, remember he keeps on pointing back to the relationship he had with him from eternity past. I want them to understand that relationship and the glory of that relationship. Why? So we can stand on the sidelines in envy, wishing we could have such a thing? No, so that we can imagine it and see that if flesh and blood and Christ can experience this, so can I. Hello? He's not holding this in abeyance for me. He's inviting me into it. He says, righteous father, even if the world does not know you, I know you. And these men that you have, uh, that, um, that you have sent me, I made known your name to them and I will continue to make it known to them so that the love that you have, uh, that, I'm sorry, the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. All the way through this is just interconnection, interconnection, interpenetration. I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. We are in the Father and the Father is in us. And all of it begins by the Holy Spirit being deposited inside of you. We started eternal union now. We have it right now. That was the whole point of this whole past year is, is trying to stir up an awareness so that we live aware of our union with God right now. We've been given the third part of the Godhead to abide in us and with us and upon us. And it was started at the day of your, of your rebirth and will continue on forever. Right? Amen. He will never leave us. Right? You can enjoy the, in, the, 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 the joys and the perfections of that union starting right now. You don't have to wait. Why are you waiting? Dive in now. Enjoy him now. Going back to John 1, picking up where we left off in verse 6, it says, A man came sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light. What light? The revelation of the world, which was God and man is united. 
He came to give a witness to testify about the light so that everyone might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify about the light, the true light who gives light to everyone who's coming into the world. There's a lot of light in there, isn't there? You know, it's, it's, it's not any wonder that the first thing that God ever created was light. Right? Can't do much in the dark. That's right. <laughs> he can't do much in the dark. Let there be light was the first proclamation from heaven. Right? And, and in, in essence, that's what he said at the fall. Because the, the promise, the very first promise God ever gave to mankind, he spoke to Eve in her fall. You know, you want to act independent of God? You want to act independent of your husband? You want to take charge of your life? You think that all of your answers is in self-control and in um, self-awareness and self-protection? Well, then you know what? From this day forward, you're going to have pain as you give children. But there's a day coming when, just like this sin, independent of your husband, independent of a husband at all, you will give birth to a child, and that child will be savior of the world. And he not only will save the world, but he himself will be the message. Ironically, and this is one part of the beauty that you begin to pick up, is because you, you get to the point where you kind of anticipate with this with God. Almost everything he says, probably everything he says, is cloaked and, and, and dripping with meaning every direction you can possibly go. In the punishment that was given to Eve was a message. She was to learn, just like the punishment to Adam. And it was a message. He was to learn. It had to do with his position as a creature and his position and his role as a male. Same for her as a female. The message was, you know what? You want to act independent of your husband? Well, then, you know, your desire is going to be towards your husband all the days of your life. And and, and one day, just to put irony into this, when you wind up having, eventually when Messiah comes and redeems what you guys just did, it's going to come independent of a husband. It's going to be a virgin birth, right? And and let's just add even more irony to that. The Savior is going to do what he does because he's a male. It wouldn't have worked if it had been a female. It couldn't have. Because it wasn't in Eve that all uh, died spiritually. It was in Adam. Right? The responsibility fell upon the head of the relationship. So it took the head of the relationship to die. It wasn't some cosmic mistake that he was born a male. It was of necessity. And that was part of the lesson as well. And these kind of little lessons are riddled through everything God does. Every word he speaks. And, and little ironies and little paradoxes are just kind of tucked away and for anybody to discover if you're looking. You know, otherwise you just read the surface and just know, oh, okay, well, she's going to paint a childbirth and one day a Messiah's going to come. Okay, thank you. And, and, that's, and that's good, but there's more to it. In it, there's paradox. In there, there's depth. In there, there's understanding. In there, there's a lesson. That God And God is big on repetition. You're going to be repeating this lesson until there is no more flesh. Right? Man will continue to work by the sweat of his brow and every work he does going to resist him and produce very, very little. And what even what it produces will have death in it. There's the lesson. Right? And it's going to be that way until you die, until you return to the dust from which you came. There's, there's wisdom and repetition. Right? Now it says... Here we go. It says in verse 10, it says, He was in the world, and the world was created by him, but the world did not recognize him. He came to what was his very own, but his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he has given, um, but to all who have received him, those who believed in his name, he has given them the right to become God's children. Children not born by human parents or by human desire or by a husband's decision, but by God himself alone. 
Now the word became flesh and took up residence among us, and we saw his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth, who came from the Father. Wu says it this way, verse 14. And the word entering, I'm sorry, and the word entering a new mode of existence became flesh and lived in a tent among us. And we gazed with attentive and careful regard and spiritual perception at his glory, a glory such as, such as that of the uniquely begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Going on in verse 15, it says, John testified about him and shouted out, This is the one, the, this one, I'm sorry, this one is the one about whom I said, He who comes after me is greater than I am because he existed before I did. Well, John technically was born before Jesus. Right? Elizabeth became pregnant with John before Mary became pregnant with Jesus. So John understood that God, Jesus, was deity. He had an existence before this physical one. He existed before I did, right? For we have all received from his fullness one grace gift after another. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only one, himself God, who is in closest fellowship with the Father, he's the one who has made him known to us. Lots in that verse. In other words, verse 18 is essentially saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No man has ever seen the Father. But if we see Jesus, we've seen the Father. Jesus was and is God the Father's self-disclosure. All of the self-revealing that God did throughout the entire Old Testament was wrapped up in flesh and lived among us. Verse 19, now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed, he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So they asked him, Who are you then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Well, then who are you? Tell us so that we may give an answer to those who have sent us. What do you say about yourself? John said, I'm the voice of one shouting in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees, so they asked John, Why then are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, or Elijah, or the prophet? John answered them and said, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not even recognize, who is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. These things happened in Bethany, across from the Jordan River, where John was baptizing. On the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, takes away the separation between God and man of the world. This is the one about whom I told you, after me comes a man who is greater than I am, who existed before me. I did not recognize him, but I came baptizing with water so that he could be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Spirit descending like a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. That's also part of the message. Not only is it the message that God can be united with man and man live in union with God, but that the Spirit of God can dwell among us and in us forever. Isn't that the first thing you received after you got born again? That's what happened to Jesus in the flesh. It remained on him. And I did not recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, this is the one. This is him. Jesus was the pattern son. His life was what ours is to be. The Spirit descended upon him and remained. That is eternal life. Arguably the most favorite, famous prediction of his arrival was written in Isaiah chapter 9. And it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. 
I'm going to read it to you. It's in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 through 7. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea and the land east of the Jordan and the Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. Hopefully this is connecting with you, connecting with eternal life. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing the spoil. For you have shattered their burdensome yoke and the rod on their shoulders and the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For the trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be turned as fuel for the fire because a child will be born for us and a son will be given to us and the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be named wonderful counselor mighty god eternal father princess a prince of peace the dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish all of these things. Now, let us take a moment to consider what's being said here before we close. Jesus was given to us. As you no doubt predicted, you know, um, uh, uh, yourself, I often think about uh, Michael Card's songs, and the final word is probably my one of my favorite, and it talks about how the incarnation of Jesus Christ was God's final word to man. He didn't need another word. He spoke the living, luminous word, and as once his will was done. And so the Father's fondest thought took on flesh and bone. Man. And so was born the baby who would die to make all of this mine. Wow, you have prepared for me a body. And that was the message. Now, Almighty God, the one who alone was responsible for creating everything that exists, that particular member of the Godhead became one of his own creations. He became a baby boy. Well, you know, what were God's intentions in the Incarnation? Well, salvation for sure, but more than salvation. We have found that he stated his intentions in John 1. In him was life, and that life was the message. It was the revelation. We learned also that life was, in fact, in the Father himself. The perfect, the perfect union, intimate union that existed between God, the Father, and Jesus, the human being, was the light, or was the revelation, or was the message to the world. It was the good news. The God loves mankind and desires to know and be known by us. Salvation is to know the Father and Jesus whom he sent. This was and is the good news of the Incarnation, that in flesh and blood can dwell the Spirit of God, and that man is able and capable to join in the shared life of the Godhead, to know and be known intimately forever. In him was life, and that life was the light, was the revelation of, of man. As I said before, Jesus was the patterned son. Scripture says it this way, that Jesus was the firstborn among many who would be like him, his brethren. He came to redeem mankind, to reveal to mankind that we were destined and created for eternal and perfect union with God, that we might become a kind of first fruits of his kind of creatures. Jesus was living proof that God and humanity could forever stand united and in intimacy. John 8, 12 tells us, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never again walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The red will have, will possess the revelation of intimacy. Jesus had life in him and was in himself the source of life as the uncreated Lord, but as a human being, being incarnate and therefore part of this creation for the sake of his suffering, he drew his life from the Father. He had to. He was a human being. 
So it is. In, so it is even in um, even though as God Jesus needed no source of life since he is the source of life. But as a human being, however, he had to have it given to him. So we read in John 5, 28, it says, For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And that was the message. That was the good news. That was the fulfillment of the announcement the night of the birth of of Jesus made by the angels. That is what all the prophecies pointed to. The incarnation was proof that God and humanity can live forever united. John revealed it was the truth of Jesus in his incarnation. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, but the darkness doesn't comprehend it. But you and I, because we've come to Christ, that veil has been removed. Amen? Amen. Now we look with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God and are being transformed into that same likeness from glory to glory, just as by the working of the Holy Spirit of God, right? And the word entering a new mode of existence became flesh and lived in a tent among us. And we gazed with attentive and careful regard and spiritual perception at his glory, a glory such as that of the uniquely begotten son from the father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, but the only one, himself God, who is in close fellowship with the Father, he has made him known to us. (laughs) So that's the message. Mine and his. In him was life. In you is life. And the same, remember Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But then later on, he said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill can't be hid. God wants you to go out and be light. Be a revelation to the world that intimacy with God is possible. The sin isn't the issue anymore. God's removed sin. He's dealt with sin. If you'll come to him and bow the knee, those sins can be not only forgiven, but removed from you. Their power to control you will be lost, and you now will have somebody else controlling you who will steer you toward union with God forever. Your sin's not standing in your way anymore. Well, that's good news. I said, that's good news, right? All right. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts or statements about what we've covered this morning? This sort of gives me different perspective on um, the scripture says your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I can't explain it right now but at least I know something's going on up here and in here yeah. that makes it different mm-hmm. I understand mm-hmm. yes 